Hello, everyone. Are citizens with populist attitudes affected the most by radical right-wing disinformation? Can exposure to radical right-wing populist messages lead to support for radical right-wing positions? To answer these questions, we have invited Michael Hameliers from the Amsterdam School of Communication Research at the University of Amsterdam. He is sharing the findings of his research published this year in our open access journal, Media and Communication. I'm Rodrigo Silva, and today let's talk about media and communication. Hello, Michael. Welcome to our episode. Hey, thanks. The first question for you would be, why is this topic so important? I think this information that revolves around sort of the deliberate manipulation or uh, fabrication of content with the intention to deceive recipients uh, is really important because there's really harmful intent behind the creation of such information. So I think it's really important that we, as researchers and also for uh, society more generally, really try to understand how exposure to false information um, is affecting citizens. That's why I think it's important to study the effects of this information uh, also in experimental settings. Of course. And when you started this research, so what were you hoping to find? What was the research gap? Yeah, so um, what I was manipulating in this experiment is not just um, false information in the sense that uh, facts were completely fabricated and completely aligned with a deceptive political agenda, but also uh, disinformation that relies on more subtle manipulations and stays closer to the truth, which has also been referred to as mal information, sort of the deliberate misuse of existing information that is placed in a different context how that actually affects uh, people and whether there's a difference in credibility between real information, um, uh, completely fabricated information, but also less uh, strong deviations from truthfulness, all aligning with a radical right-wing populist perspective. I was hoping to find that there was no, um, there was a strong difference in credibility between the most manipulated and the most accurate or most authentic content and that people are actually able to differentiate between these different levels of uh, truthfulness. Okay, so let us know about the findings. Yeah, so the most surprising finding, uh, for me at least, is that people don't make very clear distinctions in terms of uh, credibility between disinformation, the most fabricated type, and authentic information, so real uh, political speech or something that's based on uh, factually accurate information. Which I think really points to this debate that um, people have a hard time distinguishing between true information and false information. I think that was a surprise for me, but also um, an interesting finding was that um, sort of the, the the disinformation that stays closest to reality had the strongest effect on uh, radical right wing issue positions. And how would you say these findings can impact in terms of public policies, individual choice? So how can these findings translate? into real life situations. Yeah, what I think is important also if you look at how policy that aims to deal with mis and disinformation, but also how we fight or how the global fight against misinformation is focusing mostly on uh, uh, the strongest deviations from reality, the most, uh, uh, the strongest types of conspiracy narratives and very strong lies. I think what is important is to take into account that also these more subtle manipulations and disinformation that uh, stays closer to reality also can have a strong impact on people's belief. So perhaps it's also important that policy and uh, our global response to mis and disinformation also focuses on these more uh, subtle manipulations. Of course. You mentioned before some surprising findings uh, for you. Can you indicate to the researchers out there so what comes next in this topic? So what's next to study? Yeah, what I think is important is um, that this, this study only focuses on textual disinformation with a very strong anti-immigration perspective. Uh, but I think future research should also take into account of disinformation to come in uh, many different forms, such as deep fakes or cheap fakes that really relies on videos, but also more embeddings on uh, social media or ordinary citizens communicating disinformation, also in the forms of bots and trolls. So I think sort of the, the contextual factors um, that help to shape this information, I think it's important for future research to also take these differences um, in the context of false information into account. Can you provide some additional resources, some additional materials about the topic discussed today of any format? Yeah, I think um, there are a lot of nice uh, policy briefs out there if you look for them. And I think it's also good for people to 
uh, find how misinformation is different in, in different national settings. So my studies and also think from a lot of other literature out there is really focused on the US or Western Europe. I think it's good for, um, for listeners to also take into account sort of the global perspective and try to find um, uh, policy papers that have been written in different countries about uh, the dynamics of mis and disinformation, which are very different uh, across national settings. Uh, I always like to finish our episodes with a, a punchline of what we uh, just discussed. So if there is anything you want our audience to remember about this talk, what would it be, Michael? Yeah, I think that um, factual knowledge and truthfulness and reality have become uh, very much contested debates. And that's in this sort of fragmented setting that um, people no longer make a very strong distinction between levels of truthfulness on the whole and that deception can be credible Whereas um, actually truthful information can have a strong impact on attitudes. We really have to take into account that there are so many different degrees of deception and that truthfulness has become also partially in the eye of the beholder in a time where there are so many competing uh, narratives that all compete for uh, being acknowledged as legitimate versions of reality. Thank you, Michael. This episode is available on the Let's Talk About Media and Communication website, on Cogitatio's YouTube channel as well as in podcast directories such as Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, etc. Michael, it was a pleasure. Thanks. It was a pleasure talking to you.